it's now my personal pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Jenna Rose. I had the pleasure of having dinner with Jenna last night and others and getting to know her better. And I'd like to tell you a bit more about her, but she's going to tell us her sort of life career story. So I would just say that she's currently the coordinator of strategic initiatives at Canada's National Ballet School and a longtime dancer herself. And her progressive career steps are on point for today. Jenna is passionate about advancing arts and culture in Canada, but knows it takes more than passion to make your career path. So without further pas de deux, please welcome Jenna Rose. Thank you, Catherine. Those are amazing references. Well, well done. Um, okay, so, oh, sorry. So like Catherine said, I'm here to talk to you a little bit about how I was able to carve um, a career path in the arts and culture sector. But I'm by no means an expert. Uh, two years ago, I was an underemployed museum studies graduate, waitressing full time, living on my mother's couch, and anxiously awaiting for my big breakthrough into the sector. And I think to describe it as breaking through is remarkably accurate. Like anything, once you're in, it's a little bit easier to move around, but it's really finding that foot in the door moment and, and seizing that opportunity that's key. And so this is my story of how I finally broke through um, and I landed my dream entrance position, uh, the steps I took to get to that point and the strategies that I've employed since then to propel myself further and faster. So in 2009, I graduated from the University of Western Ontario with an anthropology degree, and I had no idea where or how I was going to build a career from that. I stumbled upon the Masters of Museum Studies program at the University of Toronto, which is housed under the iSchool, and I was immediately drawn to it. But upon doing some research, my tip number one, always do your research, um, I realized that I had slim to none chance of, of getting into the program without some sort of museum experience on my resume. I found out that you know, hundreds, of, uh, hundreds of people apply to this program and they only accept about 30 students per year. So um, what I decided to do is I didn't apply. Uh, instead, I took an assistant curator position at the local museum in my hometown and I worked on some extended contracts for about a year uh, just to gain that experience and have something to put on my resume. So that one year later when I applied to the program, I got in. Now, Dan Rahimi, who was at the time the Vice President of Gallery Development at the Royal Ontario Museum, he spoke to our, uh, our class during an intro session, and he generously offered up his email to us bright-eyed and bushy-tailed crop of new students, and I emailed Dan that evening, right away, um, and I introduced myself. I briefly talked about where I thought my career was heading and what I wanted to do with my life, and he almost immediately set me up with a volunteer position with the collections manager, um, one of the collections managers of the Canadiana collection at the ROM. Tip number two, leverage your status as a student or emerging professional to reach out and pursue professional development opportunities that might not otherwise be available to you. Um, the ROM has a very rigorous volunteer program and very, a few very coveted positions. But I knew that the ROM and the Museum Studies program had a very close relationship um, and had for many, many years. And so I was able to, to kind of take advantage of that, um, that connection and, and get a volunteer position. I also volunteered with the OMA, the Ontario Museum Association, uh, during my first year working the registration desk at their annual conference because I thought, what, what better way to meet and get face time with arts and culture professionals than working the registration desk and, and being a face for that, for that conference. Um, and it's, it's really vital for your early career years to use your free time to volunteer, um, not only to build your skill sets, but equally importantly, to build your relationships and positive rapport with, with people in the field. No one's gonna give you a job to do something that you've never done before, if they're not familiar with you and, and uh, if they don't see potential there. So the Museum Studies program offers an internship course which most students take because it applies the theoretical knowledge you learn in class into a museum context. Um, and I realized rather quickly when I started the program that when people enter this field, um, they hold on to those jobs. Turnover rate is not high, which I'm sure you all know. Um, and so, this brings me to my tip number three, think outside the box. And this is something that I, I kind of 
um, implement in my life and I will always implement in my career. Um, I decided to think more broadly in terms of where I wanted to do my internship. Instead of focusing on one specific museum site, I turned to the governing bodies of museums in Ontario. And I was able to arrange a double duty type role uh, working grant intake with the Ministry of Tourism, Culture and Sport while also acting as a liaison between the ministry and the OMA. And so this was, this was a really remarkable opportunity. Um, and like many internships and, and jobs that, that you'll be in, the other duties as assigned line in your job description, um, it really came, comes into play right out of the gate. My internship didn't start with all the tasks and duties that were first outlined for me, but I leapt right into the role and I was grateful for the opportunity to gain some new experience and I embraced that. Um, and that's, that's something that I really encourage you to do, embrace every opportunity. And this, you know, in hindsight, I've realized is, is kind of the essence of, of my career path. Approach every opportunity in a way that will allow you to grow and expand your skill sets. At the very least, accepting these curveball tasks and duties and embracing that other duties as assigned role. Um, if you do this in a zen and constructive way, it demonstrates your flexibility and better yet, your malleability to an employer. And that's, that's really important at this stage in your career. So this in internship set me up with a slew of valuable professional connections and mentors and friends and colleagues. And I was adamant that I didn't want to lose my connections to any of these people. Keep up with your contacts. This is a huge piece of advice that I can give to you. Um, I think it's valuable to look at your professional connections like you would any relationship in your life. Making a connection with someone isn't just about securing a business card. Um, in order to grow that relationship, it requires time, commitment, and care. Um, it's about the dialogue and the relationship that you steward following the exchange of those business cards. I continued to volunteer with the OMA following the completion of my internship. I had recurring lunches and coffees with my colleagues there and at the ministry. And I actually gained an incredible mentor and friend through the whole experience who continues to shed a lot of light on my career. And her name is Kathy. This brings me to my next tip. Pursue a mentor-mentee relationship. But I would advise that it's valuable to do so with someone outside of your workplace, someone outside of where you work directly. I've only realized this in hindsight, but I found it incredibly valuable to keep a mentor close to me over the years someone outside of my workplace because they can shed some truly objective um, viewpoints on the state of your career, um, but also they keep you connected to the sector a little more broadly because it's easy to just kind of get um, lost just within your direct workplace networks. I learned a lot from that summer internship. It marked a pivotal professional moment for me, one that I was eager to replicate. And so I realized there was actually another internship opportunity staring me in the face. Um, the Museum Studies program also offers an exhibitions class, and for the most part, students um, form groups and curate an exhibition and then put this on display at a partnering venue. Um, but I had another idea, I was thinking outside the box, and I talked to my professor about it, and I decided to uh, join up with a, with a venue as an independent person and work on a current or upcoming exhibition that they were working on. Um, to kind of get more of a, a foot in the door there, and he was very open to it. And so came the time where I had to decide who or where I was going to, uh, where I was going to do this internship. And then something very serendipitous happened. A colleague of mine from the ministry handed me the business card of someone that worked at TIFF, the Toronto International Film Festival, and he just said, I think you would be a great fit here, and I think you would really enjoy this. And I didn't know it at the time, but this really was my foot in the door moment. And he gave me that business card because of what he knew to be my career trajectory and where I wanted to go. But he also gave me that business card based on what he knew about me personally. And he knew I loved film and, and he knew I was well tapped into the pop culture realm. Um, and so I encourage you, don't be afraid to make personal connections. Reveal your interests and hobbies and your, your guilty pleasure movie and book lists uh, to your colleagues and mentors because this is really what sets you apart as an individual, so don't be afraid to have a personality because that's what's really gonna um, solidify the connections you make with people. I then did what every emerging professional hesitates to do, our generation's equivalent to the cold call. Um, I sent a cold email, um, but don't be afraid to reach out to people this way. Um, in hindsight, I've realized that the cold email has been key to some of my most successful career pursuits. 
because you can really leverage your status as an emerging professional or student. You have the power to get any and all arts and culture professionals to sit down and have a conversation over coffee. Everyone's willing to do so, so really take advantage of that opportunity. So I reached out to the then manager of volunteer and intern resources at TIFF. His name was Colin. I explained that I was a museum studies student. I explained about the exhibitions class. And I talked about the fact that given that TIFF had just opened the doors to its year-round home, TIFF Bell Light Box, one year prior, um, I thought there could be some serious potential here given the fact that TIFF was new to the museum game. He responded with excitement and explained that as fate would have it, they had just been discussing internally the potential to launch a docent program. So I met with him for an informal interview and from there we started an eight month journey together um, and we created the docent program that is now in full swing and ever evolving every year at TIFF with growing appetite. And it was, again, that was a remarkable opportunity for me and it became clear though um, at the end of my internship that there wasn't an opportunity for me to stay on at TIFF. So at this point, I'm at the end of my second year of the program. I'm ready to graduate, and there wasn't a job for me at TIFF. Um, and it's, it's really easy to get wrapped up in the disappointment um, of those situations, but I was confident in the fact that I made an impression at TIFF. I had Colin in my corner, and I believed that an opportunity might present itself down the road at some point. That little nugget of opportunity did present itself just a few months later, Following my graduation, Colin called me and offered me a very short-term contract working as a relief receptionist during one of their most busiest times of the year during the Toronto International Film Festival. And I instantly said yes, of course, but a friend of mine questioned my judgment um, and you know, she just said, you're gonna give up a, a lucrative waitressing job for a three-week contract as a receptionist, which has nothing to do with, with your field or what you have an education in, but Back to my tip, embrace every opportunity, truly. I, um, I was able to see the long-term effects that this would have on my career. I mean, A, TIFF wanted me back, so that was a great sign. B, working reception offered me more face time with donors and members and sponsors and program officers than a lot of employees there gain in a whole year working. Um, and so it, it really gave me an opportunity to work as the face of an organization, and that was really important for me. And I treated it as an opportunity similar to the interview Olympics. Um, I treated every phone call, every email, every face-to-face -face interaction as though it were going to lead to a job, or at the very least was gonna spark some sort of fruitful connection. Um, but once again, after that contract, it became apparent that there was nowhere else for me to kind of wiggle my way in a TIFF. Um, and so I returned to my waitressing job, and for about a year, um, I was just waitressing and pounding the pavement, literally trying to find a job, I applied for 300 jobs that year. Um, and it's really easy to slide from hopeful right down to anxiety riddled panic at the state of your career. Tr trust me, I've been there and it's not pretty. But uh, I then received a text message from one of my colleagues from TIFF letting me know that um, an opening had come up in her department that she thought I would be perfect for. So it turned out I had made an impact. Um, so I went in for an interview and I landed the job and I assumed the role as assistant to the Government and Foundation Relations Department at TIFF, which was an incredible opportunity. Um, this job was of an incredible value to me and it was such a natural fit. Um, I was helping to support funding applications and I therefore interacted with my colleagues from the OMA and the ministry and um, it was just, it was quite remarkable that I, I, found, I found my spot there. And then one year into my job at TIFF, a friend of mine who was in California at the time uh, reached out to me about a potential position with the Faculty of Information, the Faculty of Information Alumni Association, FIA, which is, um, again, who oversees the Museum Studies program. Um, and this friend of mine, she served a volunteer role for the association and represented the Museum Studies alumni. But being in California, she didn't feel like she was able to contribute enough directly to her position. Um, and she wanted to see if I'd be interested in joining, and, and if I was, she'd recommend me to the association. Like I said, never turn down an opportunity. So I accepted immediately, I attended the next meeting and since then my friends returned from California and we both um, serve volunteer roles and, and kind of act as the voice for the Museum Studies alum. Um, and this is something that, it's been an, an incredibly rewarding experience. It keeps me strongly connected to the sector because you know, now being in, in the ballet school role, I'm not necessarily connected to museums. So this is a way for me to stay in there. 
Um, it, it doesn't take up a lot of my time, and it's, it's the extracurriculars like this that really set you apart as a professional and set you apart as a resume sitting in a stack with 100 other qualified and educated cultural professionals. So for initiatives like that, any volunteer opportunities, it's definitely worth making the time to fit it into your, into your schedules. The next big shift in my career happened only six months ago. My mentor, Kathy, told me over lunch one day that she was retiring and moving to the East Coast, and I was sort of devastated because I was losing that, that guiding light in terms of my career. Um, so she was thinking long and hard about finding someone that too would benefit from that mentor-mentee two-way, um, that two-way relationship. And so she suggested I connect with my current boss, John, um, as we both hold the same degree and he's achieved an incredibly successful career in fundraising. She thought he'd be a good mentor fit for me. So the next day, I sent John the cold email. Um, I introduced myself and I asked him to have coffee with me at the OMA conference the following week. Like I've said before, leverage your status as, as an emerging professional or a student to ask to pick people's brains over coffee. Um, don't be afraid to go for it and send that, that email. And so a quick Google search, I did a bit of research, um, and it confirmed for me that John is a member of the OMA Council. So undoubtedly, he was going to be at the conference the following week. So I thought, what better way to connect? Now, my intention was just to pick John's brain a little bit and approach him as a mentee. But little did I know that this cold email that I sent was actually going to lead to an eventual job offer. So following our coffee uh, that next week, I maintained an email conversation with John, and a few months later, he, I was literally sitting across from him accepting a job. And that's when I assumed the role of coordinator of strategic initiatives at Canada's National Ballet School. And I'll be forever grateful uh, to Kathy for suggesting I reach out to John. And uh, she didn't know it at the time of her recommendation, but um, I danced basically my whole life. Um, 18 of those years, I was basically a competitive dancer. And for three of those years, I, I taught as well. Um, but I made that difficult decision in my early 20s to kind of give up um, my dance pursuits and, and pursue a more academic-oriented career. Um, but funny how just a few years later, my career would come full circle and it would allow me to marry my passion and my history with dance um, with my current career path in fundraising in the arts and, in arts and culture. So I've been very, very fortunate that way. So that, that sort of sums up my story. Um, now, I purposely didn't outline my career goals and objectives and kind of nail those down for you at the beginning of my speech, because to be honest, I don't really have structured goals, but uh, in, my case, in my case, I think this has actually benefited me along the way. I've sort of gone with the flow and I've let my connections and my progressing experiences guide me. I was open to every opportunity that presented itself and I've embraced the fact that to some extent my career trajectory is malleable and various factors can shape it along the way. I think you know, having an incredibly concrete goal um, kind of just narrows, narrows your vision and, and you, might, you might miss some other opportunities that could come up and, and be quite valuable to you. So all that being said, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna reiterate a couple of my, my key points or my key tips that I would like to offer to all of you. Um, obviously, we all, networking is such a huge skill that we all need to build and continue to build through our careers. But I think most importantly about that is how to do it effectively. Um, know how to tell your story. You need to be able to speak about your abilities and your experiences and your goals, if you have goals, um, with confidence and clarity and careful reflection on why these set you apart as an individual. When you're building relationships, you have to make sure you maintain contact, and I think that's that's really key in terms of in terms of continuing on the the dialogues and, and the relationships that you build through conferences and the exchange of business cards. And you have the opportunity to maximize your network's networks. So for every connection you make, um, it's it's important to realize that it kind of opens you up to that person's Rolodex. So um, you know this is an important thing moving forward whenever whenever you meet new people. And also, in seeking out a mentor, like I said, I think it's really valuable to, to find someone that works outside of your workplace because they, connect, they keep you connected so broadly and can offer you that, that objective viewpoint on where you're headed. I can't emphasize enough the importance of staying connected through volunteer opportunities, especially if you're unable to land that full-time job. Um, when I was just in that one-year stint when I was just 
um, waitressing, I was, and I lived a, a couple hours from Toronto, I was making sure to stay connected to the OMA and volunteer a couple times a week just to make sure there was not a huge gap on my resume and to stay connected with, with my networks. Always try to think outside the box to find a way in. And I think this applies to employment and volunteer positions. It applies to how you tell your story, who you connect with, events you attend, professional development opportunities. Working and networking through non-traditional arts and culture channels is valuable to employers on a resume. And it can often showcase you as a unique prospective employee. This actually brings me to my next point about um, how to strategize yourself and market yourself as, a, as valuable in a sea of extremely well and qualified, remarkable emerging professionals. You really need to take a step back and think critically about what sets you apart. And when thinking about this, I think it's important not to discount the value of what you might consider irrelevant um, in terms of your, your career and experiences, um, but no job or position or experience is irrelevant to your professional growth. Um, and I think we all need to acknowledge that. I, whole, I completely believe and I always make sure to emphasize that my experience as a waitress in the customer service industry is what really molded my personality to be conducive to the fundraising and development sphere. Much of what we do is stewardship, which is essentially customer service. Um, and so having those strong interpersonal skills is so inherent to the job. And my experience as a waitress gave me confidence in those skills, and it's really propelled me forward through my connection making and networking opportunities. And you know, all of these in incredibly valuable skills I didn't learn in the arts and culture sector, but that doesn't make them irrelevant. So you know, keep that in mind. And don't, my last, my last point is, don't be hesitant to be bold and reach out to professionals. You are in this like perfect pocket right now where you can essentially get anyone to sit down with you and have a conversation. Um, and I'm sure most of you realize that the arts and culture professionals are some of the most warm and, and open people and, and they know the struggle. So, you know, start initiating those conversations. And when you're sitting down to have these conversations over coffee, um, it's, it's actually incredibly valuable because it provides an informal forum for you to practice your, your job interview skills, essentially. Um, it's, it's really good practice um, and really helps you hone in on the messaging and how you want to, how you want to convey your skills in, in a short period of time to people. So that basically sums up my story. Um, thank you all for listening and, and thank you for Kath to Catherine for inviting me here. I very much appreciate the opportunity. Um, I don't know if we have time for questions, but I will be here all day. So if you do want to chat further, I'm here and I'm open to conversation. Um, but if not, I wish you all the best of luck in, in your career pursuits. Thank you.